women across the state, just like you, have a significant contribution to make to public life. Your connections to community, your skills and your unique perspective mean you are rich with potential to be a great local councillor. The VLGA is here to connect you with the tools, the knowledge, the skills and the contacts that you need. Hi, I'm Deborah. I'm the Women's Engagement and Project Officer at the VLGA. I run our campaign, Local Women Leading Change, and today I'm really excited to get started with Local Government 101. The Victorian Local Governance Association acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Victoria and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the traditional custodians, their elders past, present and future, and to their cultures. After this video, I want you to go onto the VLGA website and make sure that you register for one of our workshops. So these will be hosted by me on Zoom in groups of no more than 10 women and we'll have a chance to really have a chat about the activities that I set for you and any questions that you might have. So settle in, grab a pen and paper or whatever device you're using and enjoy! Did you know that women make up 50.9% of Victoria's population but only 38% of its councillors? All councils in Victoria have at least one woman councillor, but that wasn't the case until December 2012. Now, Mary Rogers was elected in 1920 to the city of Richmond, now the city of Yarra. So this year marks 100 years since she was first elected. Wouldn't it be amazing if it was also the year that we could get to 50% women's representation in local government? That would mean that we'd need to elect another 70-something women in addition to all the councillors that we have already. That's about one extra woman per council in Victoria. Will it be tough? Yes. Unachievable? I don't think so. Local government, or councils, are just one of Australia's three levels of government, alongside the state government in Spring Street and the federal government in Canberra. But unlike state and federal government, Local government is not enshrined in the Australian Constitution. Instead, it's created by an act of the Victorian Parliament, the Local Government Act. Until very recently, councils were governed by the Local Government Act 1989. But on the 24th of March, 2020, the Local Government Act 2020 passed into law, bringing with it its own changes and amendments, which we'll discuss some of those today. The Local Government Act sets out how councils are run, the roles and responsibilities of councillors and how they're elected. If you want to be a candidate, it's an essential piece of legislation to get your head around. By get your head around, I don't mean read from cover to cover, but it's really important for you to get a good understanding of your obligations under the Act. We'll cover some of that today, but you can also find out more on the VLGA website. Activity one, reflect on the following questions for discussion. Does local government have a different emphasis to the other two levels of government? What are the key differences? What does the concept of community mean to you? And how does it relate to council compared to the other two levels of government? There are 79 local government areas in Victoria, each with their own electoral structure. If you want to take a closer look at this map, it's on the Victorian Electoral Commission website, which is vc.vic.gov.au. Each Victorian council has between 5 and 11 councillors, depending on the size of its population. Most councils have internal boundaries that are called wards, and each ward is usually made up of a suburb, or a few suburbs, or a town. So you don't have to run in the ward that you live in. So if you have more connections to community in a different ward, say you work in that ward or your kids go to school in that ward, you can run in that one but you have to live in the council area that you run in. Under the Local Government Act 2020, there are three ways that a council can be structured. Number one is single member wards. That is, there are as many wards as there are councillors and each councillor is responsible for one ward. This is going to be the default option under the new Local Government Act, but it's up to the discretion for the Minister, of the Minister for Local Government as to how he applies it. Number two is uniform multi-member wards. 
You can have multiple councillors representing the same ward, but all wards must have the same number of councillors. So this option won't be possible for the councillors for the councils that currently have five or seven councillors, just because there's no way to divide that equally. And number three is unsubdivided. So this structure is usually reserved for large rural councils like um, East Gippsland Shire Council and all of the councillors represent the entire council area. Another way to get your head around the electoral structures is to think of it in terms of who can vote for the particular representatives in that ward. So only the people who live in a particular ward can vote for the councillors in that ward. The more wards there are, the less voters in each ward. If you're scratching your head at the moment thinking, this isn't how my council's composed, that's because the changes have not come into effect yet. Once they do, you'll hear about it. There are two different types of voting systems used in council elections, both of which you would have experienced before if you've voted in a state or federal election. For single member wards, we use full preferential voting, like in the House of Representatives or the lower house. You must number every box on the ballot paper in order for your vote to be counted. And if no candidate has an absolute majority of first preference votes, the preferences are distributed until one candidate has the absolute majority, so the most votes. For uniform multi-member wards and unsubdivided councils, where you're electing multiple people at the one time, we use proportional representation, like the Senate. Unlike the Senate, however, your ballot paper will not be two metres long. There's no above the line voting, so you must number every box, and there'll be less of them, I promise, on the ballot paper in the order of your choice. A candidate must receive a quota of the votes to be automatically elected. If there are not enough candidates who reach quota to fill the vacant positions, so the number of councillors, the preferences are redistributed until all positions are filled. The quota is determined by dividing the number of formal, so eligible votes, by the number of vacancies plus one. Then you add one to that number. So if 10,000 people vote and there are three councillors to be elected, your equation would be 10,000 divided by four, and then you add one. So you would need 2,501 votes to be elected outright. If you don't get that many votes, that doesn't mean that you're not elected. That's when the preference flows kick in. If this is all sounding too confusing, don't worry. We can talk about it in the group discussion. And we will talk about it a bit more in the candidate development sessions in terms of how you can use the electoral methods to structure your campaign. Activity two. What council area do you live in? What ward do you live in, if you have wards? Who are your current councillors? What is the electoral structure of your council? And what voting system applies in your ward or council? Whew. So that's all for part one of Local Government 101. So take a break, stretch your legs, do some star jumps and grab a coffee or a tea. Um, and in the next video, we'll explore what councils do and some of the important documents that guide the work of councils. What do councils do? Across the state, Victoria's 79 councils are responsible for a range of different services, policies and programs that have a huge impact on the lives of their residents. Local government delivers essential services that women access on a daily basis. Councils are a significant contributor to the Victorian economy, employing over 50,000 people, spending over $7 billion on service delivery and $2 billion on infrastructure annually and managing over $70 billion in public assets. That's big money. Councils facilitate essential community networks, provide services and act as advocates for the diverse needs of their communities through physical, social and economic planning. The services provided by each council can differ depending on its financial resources and the needs of its community. Councils receive most of their income through rates and untied government funding. But there's also quite a lot of targeted government funding that comes in 
for councils to implement particular ideas and initiatives. Local councils, above all else, provide leadership and good governance for their communities. This sits across the top of everything else that councils do, and it's really one of the most important parts of their role, and it's definitely enshrined in the Local Government Act. They develop and maintain community infrastructure, like libraries, roads, bridges, parks. They plan for future growth and development, working out what the community should look like and how we can achieve that. They provide a diverse range of services, including property, economic, human, health, recreation, and cultural services. And they enforce state and local laws relating to things like land use, environmental protection, public health, traffic, parking, and animal management. Now, this is everything from pet registration to, in your more rural and regional councils, livestock. And they provide emergency management and leadership, which is something that we're experiencing right now. All 79 councils across Victoria have some responsibility for it, including planning and responses. Activity 1. List as many council services, policies and programs that you can think of. Think of one example of a service, policy or program that councils can provide for each of the points in the last slide. Which of these are provided by your home council? Which of these have you or a family member accessed? How many of these services, policies and programs are responsive? How many are proactive? And how many are focused on maintaining current community standards? Now, key council documents. There are a few documents that are really crucial to the work of councils and are mandated under the Local Government Act. Today, we'll look at two of them that work together. There's the annual budget, which must be passed by the 30th of June each year. In particular, it allocates council spending in line with the council plan. What's the council plan, you might ask? The council plan is one of the first priorities for councils at the start of each four-year term. Under the new Local Government Act, councils must adopt their council plan by the 31st of October in the year following a general election. So we've got an election coming up this year. That means that next October, they need to have adopted their council plan. The council plan is crucial because it drives all of the work of council. If you think of councils like an organisation or a corporation, where councils are the board members, the council plan is a document that sets out all the key performance indicators or KPIs. Council plans drive the strategic direction of the council and outline its priorities, its objectives, as well as strategies for reaching those objectives and indicators for how they can monitor the progress. Importantly, it's compulsory that both of these documents that we've just spoken about go out for public consultation and community engagement. We talk about local government as being the level of government that's closest to the people. And I think this is a really great illustration of that concept. As a community member, you have the right to contribute to your council's annual budget and council plan. Whether or not you plan to run as a candidate, you really should take up this special opportunity. Now let's get into a deep dive of the council plan. I live in the city of Mooney Valley, so today I'm going to show you Mooney Valley City Council's 2017 to 2021 council plan. One of the first things that I look for in a council plan is the page or the section called about the council name. Sometimes it'll be called something like our community or about our community. Usually you'll be able to find information about the geography of the council as well as some of the community demographics. This might include current and projected population, statistics on cultural and linguistic diversity and health and wellbeing. As you can see in Rooney Valley's plan, there is also information on types of housing, economy and employment, transport use, and open spaces in the municipality. It's a really good place to start in developing your understanding of the community that you want to represent. For today's purposes, I'm also going to show you the Hepburnshire Council Plan. 
where it discusses some of the community engagement methods that they used in the development of their council plan. Rooney Valleys provides a great snapshot of the themes that were brought up during community consultation, but doesn't speak about um, as much the methods of consultation that were undertaken. So let's have a look. With the emphasis of the new Local Government Act on deliberative engagement practices, I think it's particularly important that we take a look at some of the ways that councils are forming their plans. So some of the methods that Hepburn Shire Council used are community drop-in sessions, the Our Say online forum, and a community conference that they held. And it's really important when looking at these engagement methods to see how many people contributed or participated and how meaningful these contributions were. You're never going to be able to force every community member to have their say, but the new Act will challenge councils to think of particularly innovative and effective ways to encourage citizens to participate in their council's decision-making processes. Now the next thing we'll take a look at is the planning and accountability framework. So back to Mooney Valley. This gives you an idea of how the council plan fits in with other key council documents like the annual budget and the strategic resource plan. It also shows how the council reports its progress. Now, the really exciting part, the really crucial part in my view, is the strategic objectives. Mooney Valley has 19 objectives that are framed around six key themes. You might see other councils doing this differently. Many councils stick to five or six objectives that they then elaborate on later in the plan. So these objectives are the framework for all the services, policies and programs that councils deliver. They demonstrate the priorities for the council and are the benchmarks that all initiatives are measured against. If you're part of a community group and seeking funding from council, you should always try to make sure that your funding application makes mention of at least one of the objectives in the council plan. That's what the council officers are looking for when they're writing their reports, so spell it out for them. If you take a look at a few different council plans, you'll find that most of them centre around the same themes. The key differences are how those themes are couched, and that is where the political dimension comes in. When we say that councils have to develop and adopt a new council plan, that doesn't mean that they're literally sitting there writing it from scratch. By the time the councils are elected and come together to develop the council plan, the council officers have already done countless hours of community engagement and research. What the councillors do as a group, or at the very least as a majority, is to decide on what to prioritise and how to frame those priorities. For example, in certain councils, you might see language like healthy environment or natural environment rather than climate change adaptation or addressing climate change. And once you're a councillor, you have the ability, along with your fellow councillors, to shape these priorities and thus the work of your council through the council plan. Activity two. Find and download the council plan from your council's website and then find the following information within the plan. Number one, community demographics, now and in the future. Find one thing that you didn't know or found particularly interesting. Number two, community engagement. What kind of community engagement was undertaken as part of the development of the council plan? Does it go into detail about this? What kind of community engagement would you want to undertake? Number three, planning and reporting framework. How does the council plan fit in with other key council planning and reporting documents? Number four, strategic objectives. What are the strategic objectives identified by council? List one policy, program or service that is identified for each objective. So that's all for part two of Local Government 101. So take a break, stretch your legs, do some star jumps. And in the next video, we'll be speaking about what councillors do, what it means to be a good councillor, and the legislative responsibilities, I know it's scary, of local government. What do councillors do? 
In their daily work, counsellors make decisions and become informed about local issues. They develop ideas and initiatives. They engage and consult with stakeholders and constituents. And they advocate and represent on behalf of their constituents. And they use diplomacy and collaboration. You need a lot of that when you're in the council chamber with your fellow councillors. If you're all caught up on these videos, you would remember the importance of the council plan to the work of council. All of the things that councillors do that we just spoke about shape the council plan. And conversely, the council plan also shapes how councillors go about their work throughout the term. And coming up with and adopting ideas and initiatives and in their representation of their constituents. What makes a good councillor? This is extremely subjective. Who defines what a good councillor is? Is it the media, the legislation, the CEO, the community? Or is it defined by the council themselves? Really, it's a combination of all of these factors. Is it about being consistently re-elected? Is it about always being in the local paper? Or is it about having a reputation in the community for being willing to listen and get things done? Have confidence in your own ability to be a good counsellor. You don't need to be an expert on all matters. Things like parking and planning and really complex financial decision making will be explained to you and you'll get support in how to make those decisions. And no matter how many people you impress and how well regarded you are in the community, there's always going to be somebody who thinks that you're wrong and willing to shout to tell you so. If there is something or some things that you care about, if you want to make a difference in your community, and if you have the willingness to listen and fight for change, and you're willing and ready to understand and follow the rules, you will make a good counsellor. As a counsellor, or as a candidate running for council, you have the opportunity to make a lot of change in your community. The work of a counsellor also has a big impact on your personal skills development. You may have the opportunity to influence outcomes on issues that you believe in, contribute to policy and programs that impact on the local community, meet people from other places and from all walks of life, know more about what's going on in the local community, often before anyone else does, work on a range of interesting and diverse local issues, and develop a range of policy, negotiation and procedural skills. You'll know how to run a meeting like the back of your hand. Activity one. What does being a good counsellor mean to you? List some traits and behaviours. Think of some interactions that you've had with your local, state or federal representatives. What are some examples of good leadership and what are some examples of leadership that you felt were lacking? What kind of candidate and what kind of counsellor do you hope to be? What would you hope to achieve on council or throughout the course of the campaign? With the last two, you can write it as a letter to yourself and keep it in a safe place and then have a look back on it after the election, whether or not you get elected. According to the state government, being a counsellor is a voluntary position as opposed to a professional role. That doesn't mean that it's any less important or that the responsibilities are any less significant. They're huge. But the pay reflects the voluntary designation. No one does it for the money. Being a counsellor can be considered like a part-time job. And a lot of counsellors work part or full time in paid work while juggling their family and community responsibilities. You know better than anyone else what your ability to juggle all your different responsibilities with the role of counsellor might be. I know a lot of women counsellors who really successfully balance full-time work, family and counsel, but your circumstances, including the type of counsel you want to represent, might make it a bit more difficult to do this. To have a chat to current and former counsellors at your council about how much time they spend and how they balance it with all their other responsibilities. Remember that if council meetings or briefings are at times that are inaccessible or not inclusive of councillors with family or caring responsibilities, you, along with your fellow councillors, can change that once elected. Councillors receive a taxable allowance, the exact number is determined by council, 
within the parameters set by the state government. You can find the brackets, the pay brackets online on the Know Your Council website. There are three different categories based on factors like the size of the council and the amount of the work that the government assumes you do, not necessarily how much actual work the councillors do. This can be anything from $8,833 at a small rural council to $31,444 at a larger metropolitan council. The position of mayor pays more like a full-time salary because it's taken to be a full-time position. There is a minimum number of council meetings that you have to attend as a councillor, but then additional hours spent on council matters like correspondence, events and additional meetings and briefings may vary. We'll speak about that more in a minute. A councillor survey indicated that councillors spend between 11 and 33 hours a week on council matters, but anecdotally this is not very accurate. I would say most active engaged councillors spend at least 25 to 30 hours a week on various activities, sometimes 40. Ultimately, outside of the council meetings, it's up to you to decide how much time you want to spend on council matters. There are lots of ways that you can use your time effectively and be more flexible and innovative with how you engage with your community, rather than going to every event after hours. You might decide that you want to spend that time with family and spend an afternoon in the library once a week being ready to meet with your constituents and community groups. That's just one example of how you can do it. Let's have a look at what an average week might look like for a councillor. Now this is a pretty conservative estimate. I know that a lot of councillors do much more than this and some of them do a little bit less. Council meetings and committees might take up about four hours of your week depending on how long the meetings usually go for and how many committees you're on. Remember that council meetings are one of the statutory requirements, so they're one of the things that you really can't get out of unless you have a valid excuse. Council briefings, I've said one hour. A lot of councils do longer than this, um, but it'll really depend. Reading is a really crucial part of being a councillor, so I've allocated four hours It'll depend whether you can, how good you are at speed reading, whether you can scan really quickly through documents, but it's really important that you do your pre-reading before a council meeting. I don't know if you've ever gone to a council meeting where you can see that someone really isn't prepared because they're asking questions that really were quite evident if you even read the agenda, but it becomes very clear to everyone involved that you haven't done your reading. Meeting with residents and community groups, I've allocated two hours. It'll depend on your usual weeks, how you want to be a representative, if you want to have one-on-one -on -one meetings, if you want to have smaller meetings, or if you'd rather just go to events and speak to people at those events. But I think two hours is a relatively average amount of time and it all evens out in the end. Meeting with state and federal MPs, I've allocated one hour. You won't do this every week necessarily. You won't even necessarily do this every month. But I think cumulatively, it'd be an average of one hour a week. Community events, two hours. Again, if you really love going to community events and you're going to three community events a week, this would be more like six hours. So really, again, it depends on what you prioritise and what you think is important. Council events, two hours. You might have you know, festival periods where you're doing way more than this and you might have quiet time where you're doing less. You won't necessarily have a council event to go to every week, particularly if you're just a councillor and not the mayor. Reviewing and replying to correspondence, I've said four hours. You might do more, you might do less. You might do more particularly busy periods. Social media, I've said one hour. This really depends on how much social media you're doing, how much you're using it as a medium to communicate with your community. Um, and you might not even see it as work. A lot of the time that you're on it, you might just see it as your usual social media use as a member of your community. Networking and professional development, I've put in two hours. Again, you're not necessarily going to do this every week, but if you have a one-day conference or a two-day training um, a few times a year, that basically adds up to two hours a week. 
So in total, we've put 23 hours. Again, this is pretty conservative. A lot of counsellors will be doing around 30. Some of them are doing 35 on top of another job. So it really depends, again, on what you want to achieve and how you want to be that representative. Activity two. Go to the Know Your Council website and search council remuneration. Number one, what category does your council fall under? Number two, what is the pay bracket for that category? See if you can find out from Google or your council's website how much the councillors are currently paid. Number three, where can you find this information? Number four, how much are they currently being paid? Number five, are there reasons given for the council's decision to pay themselves a higher or lower amount within their pay bracket? Number six, do you think they are being paid an appropriate amount for the work that they do? One important distinction that is lost on many community members is that between the council organisation and the councillors. Councillors are the strategic arm of council, whereas the council officers or staff are the operational arm. The chief executive officer or CEO sits between those two and is the conduit between the councillors and council officers and plays both a strategic and an operational role. The Local Government Act spells this distinction out very clearly and we'll talk about that a bit more later. This illustration represents a council chamber. Now, as you know, there might be more or less councillors in this depending on the size of the council's population. Usually the mayor and the CEO sit in the middle or at the head of the table and that represents their roles respectively as leaders of the council made up of councils or elected representatives and the organisation. You'll see that the councillors and mayor are the same colour and that represents a strategic or decision-making arm. The council officers and CEO are also the same colour, representing the operational or the administrative arm. Really, the CEO should probably be a mix of the two colours, but I'm about to tell you why it's useful to think of the CEO as an employee. We've spoken about how local governments employ 50,000 people across the state. But when it comes to the councillors, they only have one employee and that is their CEO. The recruitment and management of the CEO must be done independently and objectively by the councillors and it's something that all of the councillors are responsible for. You don't need to go into the role of councillor having experience in recruiting or managing a CEO. Councillors are supported in this by independent and objective experts or consultants. The CEO is responsible for council operations and delegates responsibilities to the appropriate staff. Councils are not the ones who decide who should be doing a particular task or how it should be done. This falls to the responsibility of the CEO. The CEO is also the one who is responsible for hiring and firing of council staff. They employ council staff according to operational requirements. The CEO is meant to provide frank and fearless advice to the mayor and councillors to support them in the decision making role. For this reason, a really solid, professional and respectful working relationship between the CEO and the councillors is crucial to the success of councils. If you look at the councils that have been sacked in recent years, this is usually due to a breakdown in the relationship between the CEO and councillors. Activity 3. Use your council's website to access this information. Number one, when are your council meetings usually held? If there is not a current schedule on the website, use the past minutes to get an idea of the usual intervals between meetings. Number two, watch a council meeting. If your council is not currently holding meetings, try to find one from another council or think of a previous council meeting that you have watched. What is one thing that you found interesting about the way that the meeting was conducted? Number three, have a look at one set of council meeting agenda and minutes. What does the agenda contain and what is noted in the minutes? Now, we're going to get on to some of the more dry stuff here. Bear with me, it's really important. According to the Local Government Act, the role of a councillor is to participate in the decision-making of council, represent the local community in that decision-making, 
and contribute to the strategic direction of Council through the development of and review of key strategic documents, including the Council Plan. Additionally, councillors must consider the diversity of interests and needs of the local community and observe principles of good governance and act with integrity and provide civic leadership in relation to the exercise of the various functions and responsibilities of the council under this act and other acts and participate in the responsible allocation of resources through, of council through the annual budget and facilitate effective communication between the council and the community. The role of a councillor does not include the performance of any functions that are specified as functions of the Chief Executive Officer under the Act. So that's verbatim from the Act. Take a breath, let it sink in. Um, it looks really complicated and really wordy, but really when you break it down, it's about representing the community and acting as that conduit between the council organisation and the community, the people that you represent. And also about making decisions in a responsible and accountable way. The legislative responsibilities of councils. As organisations, councils must provide governance and leadership for the local community through advocacy, decision making and action. Their primary objective is to achieve the best outcomes for the community and in regard to the long term and cumulative effects of decisions. And that's something that's really unique to local government. Imagine what it would be like if our state or federal government politicians were legally required to think 10, 20, 30 years ahead. I think that would be pretty amazing. Decisions must be made in a transparent and accountable manner. And in the spirit of representative democracy, the diverse needs of the local community must be taken into account in decision making. This also ties in with the deliberative engagement practices that we spoke about in relation to council plans. The decision to do the act, matter or thing is to be made by resolution of the council. And it must be made by a properly constituted council meeting, special committee or under delegation. That means that big decisions need to go before a proper meeting of council. They need to be accountable and transparent. It also means that as a councillor, you can't go into a council meeting having your position already decided that you will vote a particular way. You need to be taken to have made that decision based on the information that you're presented with or that you present at the meeting. And then, as we discussed before, it is the responsibility of the CEO to delegate the implementation of the decisions that the councillors make. Good governance. We've heard good governance mentioned before, explicitly spelled out in the legislation. Good governance is about the processes for making and implementing decisions. It's not about making the correct decisions, but it's about following the best possible process for making your decision. Practicing good governance will allow you to be a better leader. Accountability and transparency. Be transparent in your actions and decision making. You need to be able to explain and justify how you came to your decisions, the process. You'll find that even if people don't agree with you, often if you're able to explain how you came to a particular decision, they'll respect the decision that you've made. It's about being equitable, inclusive and participatory. Bring the community with you. Consider all points of view and actively empower voices that are marginalised or underrepresented. Listen. A lot of this is actually mandated in the new Local Government Act and in the Gender Equality Act. Follow the rules, speaking of acts. Ensure your actions and decisions are consistent with the laws and procedures of the forum in which you're operating. I can't tell you how many debates and different stashes I've won by being able to understand the meeting procedure properly and to be able to use that to your advantage. Effective, efficient and responsive. Balance competing interests and time pressures to ensure that concerns are addressed in an appropriate manner. Work collaboratively to achieve your objectives. We've spoken a lot about councillors being decision making and practising good governance when they're making those decisions. But what kind of decisions do you need to make? The three key areas, in my view, are financial governance, 
working out how to spend the limited money that the council has on what seems to be an infinite amount of services, policies and programs, and making sure that this is done in an effective and equitable manner. In a rate-capped environment, or one where you've got other strains related to emergencies or pandemics, what do you keep and what do you cut? Planning governance. What will our community look like over the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years? How do we set up our community for success? What steps do we need to put in place? This can also mean literally urban planning and planning approvals. And strategic direction. What are the priorities for our community and how do we achieve these? Something that many councillors struggle with when they're first elected is the transition from being an active and engaged community member to being an advocate, to being the person that has to make those tough decisions. As a councillor, you're privy to a lot more information than the average community member and tasked with keeping a lot more balls in the air, but you still have the responsibility of advocating on behalf of your community and representing their views. This can be a struggle at times. Does being a decision maker compete with the advocacy role? Being a councillor really is a balancing act between serving the community or certain segments of the community's interests and providing good corporate governance. Whew. That's all for Local Government 101. I hope I've left you with a bit to think about and a better understanding of what local government is all about. Make sure that you're signed up for a workshop. I'm really looking forward to hearing all your thoughts on the tasks that I've set you and to hear why you're interested in local government and whether you're willing to take the next step and run as a candidate. I've posted a link that has all of the activities compiled in one handy document so that you can refer back to that rather than going through all the videos. For more information about any of the topics that we've discussed today, make sure you jump on the VLGA website at vlga.org.au. You'll find this resource, your campaign toolkit, which we've developed especially for you. Remember to sign up for a workshop, like our Facebook pages, Local Women Leading Change and Victorian Local Governance Association. And always feel free to send me an email at deborah, D-E-B-O-R-A-H, at vlga.org.au if you have any questions. See you soon.